What they were makes no difference to me. Paul's conflicted appeal to authority in Galatians 2. All churches have a tension between their identity as an institution and their calling to embody their charism. On the one hand, there is a need to conform to the norms imposed by tradition and authorities, or at least to a network outside the church's walls. On the other hand, there is the charism, which, like the Ruach of the Holy Spirit, can blow in unexpected ways. For example, the apostles depicted in Acts were in the habit of going to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to pray, a mark of their institutional connection to the temple. But their charism also meant that they were daily in each other's homes, breaking bread and sharing with all who had need. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, we see a related tension. For Paul tells the Galatians that he received the endorsement of the Jerusalem apostles, while at the same time insisting that he really doesn't care who they are. This is specifically in Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. Let us look at Paul's words more closely. He is, of course, in a contest with some rival teachers for the leadership of his Galatian churches. Paul's independent, God-given charism to lead the church of Galatia is signaled first in Galatians 1, 7 through 9, by his reference to the gospel that the Galatians had first received from him. In his article called The Addressees and the Purpose of Galatians, Paul Tarazzi gives the background here. Uh, Tarazzi says, Paul had recently visited Galatia, had issued a curse on anyone who would teach a different gospel, and was surprised that they had ignored the curse so soon. Um, actually, and Tarazzi also thinks that Galatians has a letter um, he reads it so closely and thinks it's likely that the Jerusalem Council described in Acts 15 had happened specifically about the problem in Galatia. That Paul did a lot of work talking about the Galatian situation at that council. And then these people in Galatia ignored it and still wanted to take Mosaic law on themselves. The origin of Paul's gospel, directly from God, also supports Paul's desire that the Galatians recognize his charism to lead them, apart from interference from Jerusalem. Acts 15 presents Paul as willingly participating in the Jerusalem Synod. But in this first chapter of Galatians, we almost get a picture of Paul after his synodal encounter with the Jerusalem encounter with the Jerusalem pillars as saying that he no longer needs to participate in synods. His gospel and his apostolate are secure due to his calling and consecration directly from God. At the beginning of the section of Galatians on the handout, Paul alludes to God's call of Jeremiah from before his birth to be a prophet to the nations. It's Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. If Paul, like Jeremiah, was called and consecrated from before his birth for this apostolate, this means that God had a prior call on his life more foundational than any later institutional endorsement or constraint. This prior call on Paul's life, uh, independent of an institutional chain of command, is illustrated then by Paul's distinct narration of the sequence of his travels and consultations after God was revealed to him. Tarasi explains the unexpected syntax of Galatians 1, 16 through 17. Paul Tarasi says, quote, the departure for Arabia is actually the main subject of the sentence, while the author's main intention in writing it is to say that he did not go to Jerusalem. That explains the strange sense of construction. The weight of the main intention in the Apostle's mind is so overwhelming. 
start of the sentence instead of the participles. <coughs> Tarasi also talks about that euthos immediately that's there that's at the beginning of verse 16. It's kind of like, well, why is it there? Because he says immediately he did not consult. So, so why do you say immediately you do not do something? Uh, he thinks it goes with actually the idea that immediately he went to Arabia. Um, but it's so it's so important to say that he did not go to Jerusalem that that, that is put in between the immediately and, and going to Arabia. Paul takes pains to say he met first with no human being but went to Arabia. And perhaps on the basis of Galatians 4.25, this refers to Mount Sinai. The Galatians' reception of the Spirit when they first believed, to which Paul refers in chapter 3, also supports his quest to emphasize the charism side of his apostolic activity. Galatians 3, 2 through 5, mentions the Spirit three times, including a reference to the powerful acts that the Spirit works among them. It is as if Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit's activity that began among the Galatians with their reception of Paul's gospel is proof that Paul has a divine endorsement. And so he doesn't need to be concerned with what others from Jerusalem are saying. Central to Paul's gospel here at the beginning of Galatians 3 also is the focus on Christ's death. Paul asks, O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ crucified was portrayed? It is an open question whether this description simply means that Paul verbally communicated the profound implications of Christ's death, or whether Paul's body, whether through the physical sickness he experienced when he first arrived in Galatia, see the middle of chapter 4, or through the stigmata to Jesu he carried on his body the, at the end of chapter 6, portrayed Christ crucified to them perhaps led Paul to write only in this letter, quote, I have been crucified with Christ. Whichever it is, Paul's repeated appeals to the significance of Christ's death definitely form a repeated staccato response to those Gentile Christians who seek to take on the observance of Mosaic law as though it were a requirement they must fulfill. So I'm trying to say that there's this tension between Paul, who feels he has a special gift. God directly empowers Paul to make decisions and help the church. And on the other hand, a need for some outside authority to legitimate Paul. So, so that's the tension I'm trying to set up here. Careful listeners might be questioning this paper's approach though, for a variety of reasons. Maybe you're saying, Paul went to a synod in Jerusalem, the synod approved his apostolate to the nations, and that is the end of the story. But I'm trying to show you from Galatians that this was not the end of the story in Paul's relationship with the Galatians, for he needs to tell them that he did go to Jerusalem and there received the leader's approval. But he also needs Say that the office those leaders held means nothing to him. That's why we call this a conflicted appeal in the title. This is remarkable. It does not seem like a sustainable model for church polity, but it illustrates the tension all churches today experience in their self-understanding and in their relations to other church bodies. But perhaps your uneasiness with this paper is different. Perhaps you are thinking that I am equating the rival teachers who have upset Paul's relationship with his Galatian churches as equal to the synodal or apostolic authorities in Jerusalem. I agree with you that that would be a mistake. So let it be clear, in the curious position we find Paul in Galatians 2 of saying he got approved by reputed leaders whose office doesn't matter to him, I'm not equating these leaders with those rivals who have more recently disturbed Paul. Paul's repeated references to James in this letter make it probable that the rival teachers respected James 
but we cannot go so far as to equate James and other Jerusalem apostles with the rivals who are threatening to pull the Galatians out from under Paul's leadership. A more serious weakness you might be seeing in this paper is that its model of charism versus institution does not fit with Paul's ecclesiology. As Paul Tarazzi writes in a different article called The Parish in the New Testament, quote, the local church is, according to Paul, the church of God, not in some esoteric, idealized, platonic, or intangible sense, but rather in a concrete and tangible way. Indeed, it has its proistominus, those who are first among who preside over the brethren, whose duty is to labor among these and admonish them." Unquote. Or again, Tarasi says, quote, Paul's use of the term ecclesia to qualify the Gentile communities he founded reflected his understanding that they each stood on an equal footing with the one eschatological ecclesia of Jerusalem. Put otherwise, the newly founded churches were not subject to the Church of Jerusalem, but rather to the apostolic word that founded it." Unquote. So maybe you're thinking that this paper is just, uh, this is just a Roman Catholic voicing his institutional ideas with, with Margaret here uh, on this text, that this text is really about these independent churches trying to get along. Um, and I'm just seeing it through these, like, they need to have control. And someone needs to control them. <laughs> so many are worried about that and thinking that, that's, that this paper's approach is wrong because of that. Um, I'm ready to concede to Paul Tarazzi that, that Paul may not have regarded the Jerusalem church as being over all other churches. But even Tarazzi comes later in his article to say that, quote, the criterion for the church's being as well as its well-being lies in the adherence of leadership and membership alike to the apostolic teaching." Unquote. So he says the all the churches are independent and on equal footing, but they all need to be loyal to the apostolic teaching and the apostolic word. So, if I take care to define institution here as the commonly recognized apostolic teaching, I think I can continue with this paper. Paul viewed himself as independently called, gifted with a charism to found Gentile churches, but he still viewed himself, at least in an instance where his teaching was being ignored, as approved by the apostolic word in Jerusalem, which functioned as a legitimating institution for his diaconia. And lest you think this has nothing to do with the world we live in today, it might be useful here to remember that Archbishop Stilianos has described the synod as, quote, the preeminent institution of common salvation. And he ties it directly to the apostolic word, citing Apostolic Canon 34, which connects everything back to the foundation of the church on the proclamation of Jesus Christ, as Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 3. In Galatians, Paul insists then on his relative independence from the Jerusalem apostles while still making sure to say that the leaders in Jerusalem endorsed his apostolate, only specifying that he should remember the poor. Let us now turn briefly to how this tension between Paul's own charism and his connection to the synodal institution of the apostolic word figures in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. In 1 Corinthians, Paul repeatedly connects his apostolate in Corinth with other churches. There's some references here, chapter 4, chapter 7, chapter 14, twice in chapter 16. Paul even connects what's going on in Corinth and his apostolic word to them with all 
everywhere, the beginning of the letter. In that sense, Paul seems to be invoking a sort of institutional or perhaps synodal view of church authority in order to support his pastoral interventions in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 12 and 25, Paul famously signals when he is only giving an opinion, as if to say that his pastoral responses in such cases are not binding. But at the end of that chapter, chapter 7, his understated claim for legitimacy does seem to call the Corinthians to respect his own charism. He says about the widow, she is more blessed if she remains single, in my opinion. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. And that's how it ends. So he says, I just think this, but I've got God's Spirit. Is he saying, is he saying, it is merely my opinion that a widow is happier if she remains unmarried than if she marries? Or is he saying, God's Spirit is guiding me, so my opinion here and my opinions earlier in this chapter are blinding. Oh, you can worry about that tonight. I don't know. The appeal to other churches' practices, most notoriously in the question of women's participation in church, near the end of chapter 14, seems to be an appeal by Paul to the authority of an institution. He says, as in all the churches, let the women be silent. Famous, famous text that troubles people sometimes. Is he saying, here is how all other churches run their liturgies? Or is he saying, here is how all my churches run their liturgies? If Paul is referring only to his own churches, then this institutional appeal is tempered by his reference only to those churches that his own apostolic charism has founded. In either case, a relative appeal to what is appropriate for an ecclesia on the basis of other ecclesia in the Pauline sense is being made. In the church of Corinth, in which believers' own charisms were freely and aggressively exercised, Paul emphasizes the institutional connections this church has in order to curb excesses in members' exercise of their charisms. I shouldn't try to reduce everything to game theory, but it's, it seems like, so in Corinth, the, ch the church is very enthusiastic about their spiritual gifts. We get the impression that their worship services are a little bit chaotic because Paul says only one or two people can, can speak, and it has to be one in order, and things like that. So it's, it's interesting that they emphasize the charism there in their church, and as Paul speaks to them, he's talking institution. He's trying to say, other churches do it this way, so you got to do it how everyone else does. As is evident in Paul's descriptions of other churches' contributions to his collection in the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, and his greetings involving other churches in chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, the institutional leaning of 1 Corinthians is confirmed, especially in comparison to the ending of charism-asserting Galatians, where no one more specific than all who walk according to this rule, even the Israel of God, is mentioned. In the letter to the Romans, Paul definitely asserts his own charism in his opening description of wanting to visit and gain fruit among the Romans. His references also to my gospel in Romans 2.16 and his care to correct slanderous reports about his own teaching, chapter 3, beginning of chapter 6, seem also to align with the charism-leaning approach. Combined also with his desire to correct or supplement previous teaching that the Roman house churches have received from others, this is in Romans 6 and also in Romans 16, we have even more evidence for a charism-centered approach. 
Other distinct features of Paul's discourse at the end of the letter to the Romans fit with the model of Paul as one asserting his own charism, unconcerned to establish or maintain authority by highlighting his connection to an institution. Paul identifies with the strong in Romans 15.1, but asks them to respect the weak, those more scrupulous in diet and in the observance of days. After the argument of the letter concludes with the benediction of 1513, Paul offers a polite apology or acknowledgement that he has been giving advice to churches that he did not found. Quote, I am convinced that you are full of goodness, complete in all knowledge, able to counsel one another. If that were literally, literally true, why would he write the letter? But he's just apologizing. He's being polite. He continues, but I wrote you somewhat boldly to remind you of the grace given me by God, which constitutes me as a minister to the Gentiles, unquote. He goes on to describe the locations of where he has planted churches, from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. And in that description, Paul perhaps echoes how a Roman legionary might describe a series of assignments at the end of a successful 20-year career in the Roman army. So I've been saying that in a lot of Romans, the letter to the Romans, Paul treats himself, presents himself as an apostle with his own authority, his own gifts. He doesn't appeal to other outside authorities. But at the end of chapter 15 in Romans, Paul shares his desperate need for endorsement or acceptance by others. And these others are in Jerusalem. After he has set out his travel plans to the Roman house churches, listen to Paul ask for prayer at the end of Romans 15. Quote, I beg you, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and through the love of the Spirit, to wrestle together for me in your prayers on my behalf before God, that I may be rescued from the disobedient ones in Judea, and that my diaconia might be acceptable to the saints in Jerusalem, in order that, after coming in joy by God's will, I may encourage you." Unquote. We, of course, do not know exactly what had developed in Jerusalem between the time Paul wrote his letters to the Galatians and to the Romans. But this request for prayer is not the voice of one who is resting confidently in his own charism. Paul needs the approval of the saints in Jerusalem if he can arrive there after getting past those in Judea who want to kill him. It is possible to read this as a reference to Paul's planned visit to deliver his collection from his Gentile churches to the believers in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 21 films Paul's reception in Jerusalem rather delicately offering a compromise scenario in which Paul's collection is not officially accepted, but it is acknowledged by the leader's suggestion that Paul pay, perhaps out of the monies Paul has brought from the Gentile churches, for four men to complete the necessary rituals at the temple for concluding their vows to God. A complete account of the reception of Paul's collection is not provided and thus irrecoverable for us. But from the perspective of this paper, it is significant that in his letter to the Romans, where Paul seeks to gain loyalty and win support from them for his own mission to Spain, he concludes by asking for prayer that he be accepted by the saints in Jerusalem. And this must include the institutional leaders there. Let us consider again the ending of the paragraph in Galatians, describing Paul's visit with the so-called pillars, whose office means nothing to Paul. It is perhaps fitting that the last thing Paul says in his description of his visit to Jerusalem is that the reputed pillars there wanted him to remember the poor, which he was also eager to do. This last phrase again asserts Paul's independence calling readers to recognize the sufficiency of Paul's charism. It is as if Paul is saying, quote, they asked me to remember the poor, 
but I was already planning to do that. So this section in Galatians, or what's on your handout, it, it ends as it begins. In both cases, there is an assertion of Paul's charism. Separated by God from before his birth, and independently planning for what the Jerusalem leaders would later ask of him. In the context of his own letters, of course, the collection of money that Paul was organizing for the poor in Jerusalem was of no little concern to him. He describes it as an ecclesiastical necessity in Romans 15, 27. If the Gentiles share in the Hebrews' spiritual inheritance, then the Gentiles are obligated to make a return in material support. Nowhere else in the three other letters where Paul promotes his collection and gives reasons why his churches should contribute to it, does Paul say that the collection is what the Jerusalem authorities asked him to do. But one does wonder, especially since he seems in Romans 15 at the end, so fixed on personally going to Jerusalem, perhaps with this collection, at risk to his own life, whether it's an external compulsion, an institutional apostolic order, as it were, that drew him back to Jerusalem, and that that is what is pulling him there, he's regarding that as the source of an institution, an apostolic word, somehow that's connected to his churches in the diaspora. In other words, they asked me to remember the poor might refer to what was more of a demand from the Jerusalem apostles than the gentle request it first appears to be in Galatians 2.10. As in Romans, where Paul concludes by asking that his diaconia be acceptable to the saints in Jerusalem, so here in Galatians 2, where Paul describes his visit to Jerusalem sometime near the beginning of his ministry to the Gentiles, the conclusions betray a dependence on the institution that his earlier discourse seeks to minimize. One might say that Paul doth protest too much his independent apostolic charism. For in the end, he really does need the institutional approval, that connection to the apostolic word, both near the beginning of his ministry, as we see in Galatians 2, and also at its end, as we see near the end of Romans 15. May God grant us all the wisdom to find our way between the charism and the institution in our diaconate.